So my name is uh, Scott Kindred. Uh, I'm with uh, Kindred Hydro um, up here in the Seattle area, and uh, I'll be your your moderator today. The um, first thing I wanted to do was uh, just talk a little bit about the PNCWA Stormwater Committee. We're a new committee, just uh, just started last last fall at our first meeting at the at the conference last fall. And um, I think we have, uh, I think we have about 20 members so far, something like that. Jadine probably has a better, better idea. But anyway, we're always, um, always welcome, welcoming to uh, new um, committee members. Um, the, uh, the types of activities that uh, we're um, engaging in are webinars, like what you, uh, what's going on today. There's also going to, um, uh, we're looking to have a pre-conference workshop and, um, and then there'll be a stormwater track at the, uh, at the annual conference in the fall and, and then articles in the, uh, in the newsletter. So uh, we have, um, we also have a, a, a member, a committee member call coming up on August 10th there. I've got that on the slide, which you're welcome to, uh, participate in. And if you want details, I provided a link to the website there. And you can always email the chair of the committee that uh, Jadine um, Stensland with Clean Water Services. And her email is there. And she's going to be one of our speakers today. So you'll get a chance to hear her talk for a bit. Uh, I also wanted to bring attention to a couple of awards. Both of these awards are new this year. The um, the, one of them is the Stormwater Professional Excellence Award, and the other one is the Innovative Stormwater Project Award. There's uh, the applications are due on the 28th, which is um, 10 days away. So there's still time to get in an application, and um, the link for more information is shown on the slide there. So moving on to the webinar, there's uh, I've just got a summary of what we're going to cover up here. Uh, this is focused on um, retrofit planning and implementation, stormwater retrofit. And there's kind of um, uh, what we're looking at is uh, the, our presenters are going to talk about the strategies that they that they utilized and give case studies of the types of projects that they're um, either implementing or in, in hopes of implementing. And I've listed, um, you know, the types of objectives that they're typically looking to achieve with, uh, with the retrofit projects. Um, the, the presentations today are going to focus on, on regional watershed planning tools and approaches, how to identify, assess, and rank your retrofit opportunities, and then use some case studies. And the nice thing about the presenters today is that we have um, we have representatives from three different sized jurisdictions. We have uh, um, we have one speaker from Duval, which is a small town here in uh, Western Washington. Another presenter from the city of Kirkland, which is a medium sized city on Lake Washington. And then a large uh, jurisdiction, Clean Water Services, down um, outside the uh, the Portland area. I think they have about a half a million residents in their in their service area. And our speakers here, Jadine Stensland from uh, the Clean Water Services, Larissa Grindel from Duval, and Jenny Gauss from Kirkland. And I'm going to start off with a poll question for all the attendees, and I'm going to ask Michael to um, go ahead and bring that up. This is the one on identifying where our attendees uh, work. I would say that um, this is... Uh, for the, the myself and the three speakers, this is the first time that we've uh, 
we've done one of these webinars, so uh, there may be a few little bumps along the road, so please forgive us if that occurs. So at this stage, you should see the poll up there and go ahead and select where you work, give, uh, give our speakers a little bit of an idea where people are located. See, we're not getting anyone voting here, so I wonder if we're having some technical problems here. Um, let's see, we got one person with their hand up here. Let's see what that question is. Um, I'm going to close this uh, poll, Scott. Okay. Well, that looks like Robin. Okay. All right. Uh, <clears throat> so. Uh, I'm not sure why that uh, poll didn't allow people to uh, vote. Maybe it's in the system and I have to check something I didn't check, but we'll try for that on the next question. Thanks. So back to you, Scott. Okay, so I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Jadine Stenslin. She's, um, she's a senior engineer at Clean Water Services and uh, the chair of our uh, Stormwater Committee. Um, has done a lot of a lot of work on that over the last year. She's also a member of the the WEF Stormwater Committee, the national organization, and um, she's got 20 years of experience and uh, a master's in bioresource engineering. And Jadine, I'm going to at this stage of the game um, ask you to take control of the screen and start your presentation. Thank you, Scott. Let me get up and running here. Okay, hopefully everyone can see my title slide. Um, so thank you for participating in our webinar. I'm going to just kind of go over the agenda really quickly, what I'm going to be talking about, who we are, Clean Water Services, and then do a little intro about what we're doing with water quality and low impact um, development approaches, as well as talk about tools and techniques. Clean Water Services in Washington County, Oregon, really promotes effective stormwater management as a critical component of community development and a healthy economy. The presentation is going to highlight several innovative stormwater strategies to reduce flooding, enhance water quality treatment, connect people to nature, enhance wildlife habitat, and expand watershed resiliency. The development and construction of four recent projects will be presented to develop these strategies, including some landscape scale planning, vegetated mats for water quality facilities, real-time control peak flow management, bioengineered grade control, and outfall protection. The local community um, is partnering with us to support a healthy, resilient watershed that functions to support both people and, the wild, and our wildlife. So Clean Water Services is an urban service district in the Tualatin River Basin. We're a watershed-based utility. We do wastewater, stormwater, and surface water. And we serve about 560,000 customers, kind of on the west side of the city of Portland. Um, we're in Washington County. We re clean and recycle about 60 million gallons a day of wastewater. We have four regional treatment plants, over 800 miles of pipe, and 41 pump stations. Clean Water Services is a phase one MS4 jurisdiction, and we recently received our new permit, which included developing a mi hydro modification and retrofit plans. So we have the opportunity to develop a watershed and stormwater approaches that truly meet the goals of the Clean Water Act. Clean, drinkable, swimmable, and fishable streams. And we're working at in, in, um, including that in our process. So in addition to our traditional water quality facilities like extended dry basins, vegetated swales, constructed um, water quality wetlands, we're also doing incorporating more low impact development approaches like repairing and enhancement and floodplain connection um, and looking at significant tree preservation and really working on site design on how to minimize 
um, impervious area. So we have lots of great examples to showcase, including green streets, green street planters, green roofs, and porous pavements. But I want to talk about some other things, like landscape approach. Our main objective is to incorporate a watershed landscape approach, because the main, act, the main goal of the Clean Water Act is to protect and preserve our precious water resources. And so Clean Water Services is partnering with our, uh, we are partnering to ensure that we keep our eye on that prize, that clean, healthy water. So the way that we're doing that is, is, in addition to the upland facilities and LIDA for water quality treatment, we're looking to see if we can expand the riparian resource to protect it, enhance it, reduce the stream energy before it gets into the corridor that causes erosion and incision. We're looking for ways to provide groundwater management like water storage, both short, short and long term, to kind of reduce hydro modification. And we're also uh, working with, with shade to help with plantings and coordinating with our trails and parks and rec departments. Um, to provide those kind of services. So we're looking beyond just any specific reach, we're looking uh, at the watershed level. So one of the places we've been able to incorporate this landscape approach is in the North Bethany development. It really is our outdoor laboratory. It's an 800 acre new development site that has several streams with tributaries that need protection or enhancement. We're providing the water quality treatment in that upland and developed areas using traditional approaches for water quality treatment. And we're looking for opportunities to incorporate and enhance, to enhance and, rest and restore. And we're really lucky to have this outdoor laboratory. Within North Bethany development, we have an area called Abbey Creek and at the headwaters, there is a irrigation pond that we are turning into a nice constructed wetland upstream of at the headwaters of Abbey Creek. It's currently called Basin 13 and this is kind of a demonstration of what we hope to see happen there. So this next slide is Scott. Scott, can you take over and do the video for me? Yeah, I'll go ahead and do that. Okay, so hopefully everyone is seeing this. This is a one minute video, um, if it performs well here. So this is the Abbey Creek approach outlined in red. And I talked about that irrigation pond that's um, at the upstream end of the creek. So that area we're going to enhance, provide water quality treatment and um, make that back into kind of a natural headwaters area. In the second area, it's kind of really steep area so we want to provide energy um, great control and energy dissipation so we're putting in these pole veins that I'll talk about a little later. In the third area we have an ir another irrigation pond that we're going to incorporate real-time control on I'm going to talk about that later too to provide just peak flow um, control and when it's when the water's down we can let it just be a natural wetland area. And in the very far downstream area is a nice wetland and so we want to enhance that area. It has some incised portions of the creek, and so we want to engage the floodplain where we can and um, using wood and other natural bioengineered methods. And hopefully beaver will be in there and provide a nice, um, continue to keep that as a nice wetland area. So this reach um, is on the north side of North Bethany, and we we're planning to incorporate several different applications that meet the um, the area that we have there, but from the agricultural area over on the left, the right hand side, going down through the steep banks and then down into the floodplain. And then it'll go out into Rock Creek, into more of an agricultural area outside of the urban area. So at this stage, do you want to go ahead and take back um, control of the screen there, JD? Yes. OK, 
Okay. So like I said, there's several creeks and tributaries in this area. That is an, um, Abbey Creek is an area that we're just under development of design. We also have been working in the Bethany Creek area, and people have probably seen some information about this. It was um, originally, when it first came into development, it had been turned into, the creek had been turned into a straightened and incised agricultural ditch, like you see on the left-hand side. So we're hoping to return this area to natural functioning system, um, a system, which is our vision over on the right. We are working with the Parks and Rec Department. There's trails on either side of this area, and um, they are incorporating boardwalks and other access along these, this creek area. So this is kind of connecting people to nature, getting people out and um, enjoying the area. So for Bethany Creek, this is an area that has new stormwater discharges to a degraded creek area. The existing conditions include channelized stream, degraded wetland, lots of incision in the creek, no riparian area, and no biodiversity. This is kind of an over overview of it. On the far left-hand side, you can see the development starting to occur up there off of Eleanor. That's where a, an old irrigation pond is being turned into a water quality facility. And then down the center of your creek where the green area is, is Bethany Creek and it runs um, through the, throughout the slide there. This is kind of the same view. You see Eleanor over on the right. And what we hope to enhance this area to become where not only is it providing the stormwater um, functions, it's also providing habitat and locations for trails, forested wetlands, and riparian forest. And so we're in the first, we're actually just starting the second year of construction of this area. Um, on the left-hand side is how it looked at the end of construction last year, last summer, August of 2016. And on the right-hand side is a current picture of how, it, how it's functioning and working right now. We'll continue to do construction um, this summer on the up, uphill side of this creek area. And you can see the houses that are right next door already developed on the left-hand side, and the embankments are going to be more houses on the, I'm sorry, on the Right-hand side are the house is already constructed, and on the left-hand side, you can see the embankments for the new development that will be occurring this summer. So you don't always have the opportunity to work with new development. When we can, we do. But a lot of times, retrofits are occurring in infill areas. And you really have to take these as opportunities and try to optimize them the best you can. Funding from these projects seem to be a big, the biggest hurdle with all the performance standards and requirements. Sometimes these don't get as much priority. So we're usually looking at things with relatively smaller size. You try to make sure that you can get that water quality treatment. When possible, we, we try to work in some stream restoration. We're doing improvements to the conveyance system as necessary, and they really are um, opportunistic. But one way Clean Water Services has been able to do these retrofit projects is through public-private partnerships. They're a very useful tool to capture additional drainage area that was developed before regu regulations required. The district was fortunate to be able to work with the Beaverton Elks. They wanted to build a new lodge on existing property but as a volunteer organization, they didn't really know how to meet all the stormwater requirements. We partnered with them to design the parking lot LIDA, as well as install the regional water quali quality facility on the backside of their lot to treat an additional 27 acres of upstream drainage area. This area would have just been turned into parking lot, and we were able to keep it green and provide that additional stormwater treatment for areas that would not have probably had it. In addition, they had a degraded stream on their lot, so we designed and built a floodplain connection project to enhance their stream corridor. So 
behind the sign, you can kind of see our regional facility. When we, we're still installing it, so you can see some of the irrigation, um, temporary irrigation pipes that are sticking up around it. So that's our stormwater facility that's providing treatment of the upstream 27 acres. Another fun thing that we were able to do is provide interpretive signage about stormwater management. They were conditioned by the county to provide a 10 foot wide ac public access route that went through their property. And so we put these signs in to kind of educate and um, support the promotion of stormwater facilities. So now I'm gonna move on to some other tools and techniques that we've been using. One of the very interesting ones is real-time control. We're using this in several locations in the North Bethany area that I mentioned earlier. So what is real-time control? It's really the application and use of sensors, telemetry, and computer logic to continuously monitor and adapt the control, adaptively control the water surface infrastructure. Like I said, Bethany Creek Falls is one of the locations um, that is using a real-time control. The nice view of the photo or the, of the equipment on the left it includes the control panel, and in the vault in the foreground is the actuated valve. Uh, actuated valve. On the right-hand side, you can kind of see the dashboard that you see on your screen. It shows the surface water elevations and the rainfall forecast on the top. And it's also linked to the NOAA radar data for monitoring. So we can look at six, 18, and 30 year for, or 30 um, hour forecasts to see what's coming. It's, we also connected a camera, so we're able to view the site remotely. And that's what the photo is there. So we can see as the water level comes up and down, we can get a visual both using the charts as well as a visual. So really continuously monitoring our rainfall forecasts and checking the condition and the status of the facilities and or the stream really helps us in making decisions and op for optimal system performance. We now have four of these um, and a fifth one planned um, in our system. So the next thing we're going to talk about is new construction techniques that we're using at Clean Water Services. Um, I have three project sites that I'm going to talk about, the Alden Street Water Quality Facility Retrofit, um, Brookside, and the West Bethany Outfall. These projects have all been put in in the last year or two, and they're performing really well. The first one was the Alden Street Water Quality Retrofit. Well, we need water quality facilities to be able to manage rainfall runoff and concentrated flows um, right away. And sometimes what we've seen happen is that we have some incision that's happening right at the outfall, even with those energy dissipation and the rock, um, right where it hits the native ground, we're seeing a lot of erosion happening. And sometimes, so what we've done a lot of times is um, use a plant establishment period. So we actually get the plants established before we're putting any concentrated flow on site. But sometimes you've got to get those water quality facilities operational right away. And when you need to do that, we've gone to growing these vegetated mats and installing them right at the outfall locations. These mats have sturdy roots and matting to help protect from erosion. And they create better est uh, plant establishment in really difficult areas like outfalls or on the inside bends. And we're seeing these perform really well on um, a couple different projects. And so we're, we're growing additional ones. And um, we hope that the landscape industry takes um, this idea and can, can grow them commercially. Another technique we're doing is bioengineered grade control. We're calling them pole veins um, and, and energy dissipation. Um, they are wooden stakes. They're, depending on the site and location and the flows, they're two inch to eight inch in diameter. They allow for energy dissipation, grade control, and sediment buildup behind them. We're using them in areas of incision to adaptively manage um, the sites. And we're using them both in the creeks 
as well as water quality facility outfalls where incision is occurring. And so some of the photos are of larger pole veins, which we're using more in creeks. And then what the picture on the right um, is some smaller two and four inch diameter that we're using at the outfall of the Alden Creek, Alden, um, Alden Road Water Quality Facility. And I do have to show some nice pictures of our facility. So this is um, in its second year of construction here, just this summer, and they really are looking good. Um, nice biodiversity that we see in the plants, um, no, no significant erosion. Um, everything's going really well with that facility. Nice stable um, flow path for the stormwater. And so to finish up, I'm gonna share some photos of outfall protection. People have been using this type of protection for a long time, but we're really incorporating them into our stream um, enhancement and floodplain enhancement. We incorporate bubblers and stilling wells for better energy dissipation before the stormwater actually gets to the creeks. This is an area that is developing and the developer is required to build an outfall outside of the vegetative corridor or riparian areas. But in this case, there's a 50 foot wide corridor that was an old ag field. So the outfall, that was built um, by the developer is kind of a stilling well, a little bit different to allow the water to slow down and um, reduce some of its energy. And then we're experimenting with the wattles and the jute matting as a temporary measure um, so that we can get through um, this next winter before we can actually do the floodplain enhancement work that we're planning for next construction season. So um, you're looking at the outfall on the right hand side, it's on the corner. Um, looking down into the creek, and then the photo on the left-hand side is kind of looking back at the outfall, and you can see the development that's occurring um, just behind there. And Brookside Drive is another project that we did recently that uses a bubbler to reduce energy from the stormwater system before it's entering the creek. This is a steep terrain area that can be very flashy when we have those intense rainstorms. And due to the elevation change from the road above, we are able to use the height to dissipate the energy. So the stormwater comes down the hill, it fills up an underground manhole, and then bubbles out the grate on top, gently reaching the small stream below. So on the right-hand side, it's kind of looking across towards the bubbler. You can see it in the, in the middle of the rocks there, the grate that's outfalling it. In the foreground, you see a little fire pit that the homeowner has there. That's not part of the system. And the creek's kind of in between them. And then I have a close up on the left hand side that kind of shows the bubbler, the top grate of the bubbler um, and the rock dissipation that goes down into the creek. So this actually wraps up my presentation about the tools and techniques for stormwater management that we're using here in Clean Water Services. Just wondering if there are any questions. So um, go feel free to um, submit any questions in the Q and A. Um, and uh, well, uh, while we're waiting on that, um, I I had a I had a couple of questions, Jadine. Um, so on the the Bethany Creek example that you gave, um, which was you indicated was a new, you know, a new development. Was that actually funded by the developer, or did uh, was that um, was that something that uh, was funded by your agency? We have developed a, um, a regional stormwater fee for that area, um, so they the developers are paying for it um, through that regional fee. Oh, okay. Any other questions at this stage of the game? We will have um, we will have time at the end for questions to address to all the panel members.
At this stage of the game, um, Michael, do we want to try the other? Do we want to try the poll again? See if we can get that to work. Okay, that uh, poll window should be up in front of you. Uh, if it's not working, you have to accept my apologies, not the um, panelists. Um, it's a new system that we're using, and as far as I know, we're doing this correctly, but uh, uh, none of your answers are showing up. So click on where you are. It's a multiple choice. Uh, oh, 6% voted. Okay, so there we go. We just had to ask people to participate, maybe. Well, so Michael, that might be me. This is Scott. I, I actually voted. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, um, so that's interesting. Uh, uh, five of 16, six of 16. So they were going over into the attendees also. Oh, good. So okay. um, um, how about uh, we've been in this for a minute. I'm going to end this and uh, you can see the results. Um, where people are. And if you want to try the second poll question, we can go to that. Up to you. So now, Michael, I'm not seeing the second one. Oh, okay. Well, let's see here. Yeah, I am uh, unable to launch the second question for some reason. I apologize for that, Scott. So. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll. Uh, that's not a key part of the of the um, webinar here, so we'll keep moving along. I'm going to go ahead and interview our our interview. I'm going to introduce our next speaker, Larissa Grindel. Uh, she's the stormwater management manager at City of Duval, and I'm going to apologize for the typo. I just noticed uh, Duval actually has two L's. She has a, a Bachelor of Science in Civil and Environmental Engineering. She actually, um, before she went back to school, she worked in aviation operations and maintenance, so she's got a diverse background. She's currently responsible for coordinating NPDES compliance, uh, development review, and utility inspections. So as is typical of working for a small town, she uh, wears many different hats. And she's also uh, working on uh, the planning effort to um, on the city's uh, community environmental focused surface and stormwater management practices. And um, at this stage of the game, Larissa's uh, got her her presentation up and ready to go. And um, um, go, I'll take it away. Thank you, Scott. Um, good morning. My name is Loris Grundell, and I'm working for Duval Public Works Department. Um, also joining me today in my office is our consultant with ESA, Aaron Boy. He has done a lot of heavy lifting for us with this project, not to mention all of this hard work he did on our watershed plan. And he'll be joining me at the end of the presentation to help answer questions. Duval is a small town adjacent to the east edge of the Snoqualmie River Valley and approximately 25 miles northeast of Seattle. Duval was founded in 1913 on timber and farming, but the city has changed over time to become what many consider a bedroom community for nearby commercial and high-tech centers while still maintaining a unique rural small town feel. During today's presentation, I will give a brief background of Duval's adopted 2015 watershed plan and stormwater infrastructure, and also talk about current and past requirements. Then I'll go into more detail about our stormwater retrofit design project, which includes uh, analysis and retrofits for existing facilities and a low impact development toolbox for use with future development. Um, about our watershed plan, it's important for me to spend just a couple of minutes providing background on the city's watershed plan, mostly because the completed assessment and policies and implementation strategies adopted have informed the current stormwater project effort. What you see on the right is the result and establishment of five sub-basin management groups, group one being of the highest importance and group three being below average importance and highly degraded. The image on the left is the output uh, 
from aggregate scores. And this gave us the opportunity to understand where we could plan for improvement based on the level of degradation. This effort included a combination of primary and secondary analysis to assess 14 subbasins extending across the city and urban growth areas. The primary analysis was a rerun of, oops, I skipped ahead. The, prop, the primary analysis was a rerun of Puget Sound watershed characterization focused on ecology's overall water flow model results, while second, secondary analysis includes the use of finer scale information to better understand the watershed process. With this watershed plan, we wanted an integrated approach to address urban flooding associated with excess stormwater, uh, focus growth in areas that would not create new downstream problems, and protection of wetlands, steep slopes, and other sensitive areas. Studying the watershed basins in Duval would inform decisions that avoid creating or exacerbating downstream problems. The management groups that were identified provided a framework for implementation of the adopted watershed plan. The intent of each group uh, serves as an overlay where specific policies, uh, management approaches, and development standards are then applied. Two conceptual development scenarios for the North Urban Growth Area were developed during the review process. Um, these were on the left, a standard development scenario, and on the right, a watershed plan development scenario. The key differences between these being that the watershed plan development scenario sets a framework for integrated approaches that will better preserve and or restore forest cover, habitat connectivity, required open spaces, and stormwater management. In Duval, our, our population has increased from approximately 800 residents in 1980 to 7,500 in 2016. In general, the city slopes down from an upland plain at an approximate elevation of 500 feet in the east down to the Snoqualmie Valley floodplain at an approximate elevation of 50 feet to the west and we're also constrained to the north with the Cherry Valley floodplain. Soils within the, within the city um, are generally uh, glacial till, except for some glacially consolidated advanced outwash to the northeast, um, and then the fine-grained floodplain sediments within the valley. Dense forested areas are generally located outside of city limits um, to the northeast and the south, with some forested areas along the Co Clemens Creek corridor along Snoqualmie River and in undeveloped pockets within the city. Surface water generally flows west to the Snoqualmie River and Co Clemens Creek and north to Cherry Valley tributaries. Currently, there are a total of 17 public work staff for standalone sewer, water, transportation, parks, and stormwater systems. Um, of that, we have about three and a half full-time employees for stormwater work, including maintenance and operations. And I spend about 25% or 20% of my time dedicated to, dedicated to stormwater engineering for projects, planning, and grant work. Um, this is a screenshot of the city's stormwater map that includes stormwater infrastructure, such as our facilities, vaults, ponds, swales, um, and also catch basins, outfalls, and conveyance. The map was developed in GIS based on previous mapping and as-built information in 2008 and 2009 in order to comply with our NPDES permit requirement. Um, mapping has been updated as a part of the current stormwater planning F uh oh There we go. It's been updated as a part of our current effort and includes attributing of all facilities. This updated mapping effort is the basis for facility analysis, maintenance and operation documentation, and asset management. Um, our regulation requirements are that of a phase two city since 2008. Currently, the 1997 plan focuses on basin mapping um, and capital improvement program project list and funding. Uh, municipal code updates focused on NPDES compliance, and they include things like illicit discharge, maintenance and operation requirements, and include a 25% rate reduction for privately owned and operated facilities that stay clean and compliant. The effort for the current update focuses on a watershed approach to stormwater planning, along with retrofit analysis and ranking. The CIP cost estimate uh, funding approaches, 
low impact development, and other development and MPDS requirements will also be improved through this process. Five retrofit pre-design reports will be produced from the grant-led efforts that I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and these reports will help assist us in future permitting and grant opportunities, and will also assist in understanding the cost and design parameters for other retrofit opportunities. So talking a little bit about our retrofits, uh, pictured above to the right um, is an image of a failed slope, and then inset is uh, Taylor Park which sits at the top of the slope of the north side of the Coe Clemens Creek Ravine. Existing systems were installed in accordance with standards in effect at the time of development. However, we are now retrofitting. We all know that currently retrofitting to standards could improve performance and reduce potential downstream erosion associated with impacts, including water quality degradation. The city has adopted the 2016 King County Surface Water Design Manual and we enforce all MPDES phase two permit requirements. However, approximately 80% of our stormwater facilities were constructed prior to the current detention and flow control requirements. Identifying these is important to us because using the pre-1998 design manuals included a variety of approaches that did not provide significant detention and flow reduction. Um, when using the 1998 to 2005 manuals, and the level two flow control, for example, um, the design basis for detention was half of the two through 50 year peak flows. Uh, projects designed between 2005 and today, there is an additional requirement of matching the historic peak flows for the two and 10 year design storms and half of the two through 50 year peaks. The big difference here being that current requirements include historic site conditions, also meaning fully forested conditions prior to any development. Pictured here are the retrofit projects that focused on issues in Coe Clemens Creek. Um, the installation of a $300,000 soldier pile wall to protect the park and the creek below. Um, a culvert replacement project downstream of the ravine, which crosses under State Route 203, which was also considered a fish barrier. And uh, the Cary Ray Pond retrofit, which is upstream of the ravine to help attenuate flows and also um, added a large energy dissipator. What this means for Duval. The city has had um, a long time desire and need to update the stormwater plan, but have lacked the funding required. To address this, we applied for and were awarded a National Estuary Program grant of approximately $200,000, which it'll update the 1997 stormwater plan using this watershed-based planning approach. Um, continue to build on previous retrofit projects and also update our 1997 CIP project list um, while also updating technical information, which is built on in-house GIS and will help to create a prioritized list, which will identify the five conceptual design retrofit projects we get from the grant. With the update of our stormwater plan and facility analysis approach, we formed a technical advisory group, which included staff from King County, uh, the Department of Ecology, nonprofit organizations, including the Stewardship Partners, Snoqualmie Tribe Liaisons, uh, staff and city representatives, and our wonderful consultants, ESA and SDA. This is an outline of our NEP grant tasks. What I'll be focusing on today are identifying sub-basins, uh, GIS mapping, the analysis of mapping and facility information, evaluation and prioritizing the existing facilities to create a citywide project list, and from that list, identifying those retrofit projects for conceptual design reports. So our first step is identify. We started big with the watershed, a watershed-based approach, identification at the sub-basin level, building on those 14 sub-basins I talked about earlier in the 2015 watershed plan and then applying yet an even finer filter to scale down the larger basins to the plat or development level in order to analyze the facilities, which would inform our prioritization list. The watershed boundaries were first developed as a part of the 1997 work. Um, in 2012 to 2014, there were updates with specific mapping and improved topo and LIDAR. And the current update focuses on development uh, plat level at a plat level basis as part of our current grant work. So in general, 
the development scale drainage would drain to a stormwater facility or facilities installed at the time of development. And then this plat level subbasin approach allows us to analyze different ages of development to understand the characteristics of discharge from the development after leaving a facility. From our GIS mapping, the two parameters that we established and focused on throughout this project came down to water quality and erosion. The next step is targeting retrofit sub is targeting retrofit subbasins is understanding and identifying where our facilities discharge to. Um, the outflow locations that were most important to us based on water quality and detention or erosion were the Cherry Creek tributaries um, along the northern edge of the city, Lake Rasmussen, which is the headwaters for a Cherry Creek tributary, and Coquemins Creek and Thayer Creek, which discharged the Snoqualmie. And of course, the floodplain in Snoqualmie River. Our GIS mapping efforts have given us a wealth of information and about impervious surface and management of stormwater in the city of Duval. All impervious surfaces that can be seen in the 2015 King County aerial photo have been mapped. Um, this includes details about the type of surface that it is, whether it's a roof, a sidewalk, a roadway, a driveway, or a deck. Um, that way we can uh, sort the information and organize it based on pollution generating and non-pollution generating impervious surfaces. Next, we linked all mapped impervious surfaces to a specific stormwater facility, or as indicated in, on the map in red, uh, as having no traditional facility, but having pipe or ditch conveyance and catch basins. Uh, the colors on the map shown are based on that uh, performance that we established to be the, the stormwater design manual used at the time. We continue to add information to all of our map facilities, uh, catch basins and conveyance, such as uh, type, material, size, the year that it was installed, the design basis used, who owns it, if it's private or public, uh, any available detention and water quality volume, pipe slope, elevations of vault inverts, um, and added detail to catch basin information and outfall locations. This information was pulled uh, from as built field, field verification, site visits, and historical maintenance and operations knowledge that exists within public work staff. After completion of our mapping efforts, we began by characterizing and identifying priorities in order to analyze each facility. We broke this up into three main categories performance, opportunity, and outfall location. The first characterization I'm gonna talk about is our performance based. In the image shown, you can see the impervious surfaces which are color coded to a specific facility. These facilities were then given a score based on the standard in effect at the time of development, which we categorized as the design manual used. For these scores, a higher number indicates a lower standard, or in some cases, no facility or treatment at all. Next, we looked at opportunity, which we based on facility type. This approach also takes into account the retrofit option available based on the existing facility type. The image on the left is a large vault with no room for expansion, and the image on the right is, is, is an existing pond with room for expansion on site, or possible bioretention or other low, pack in, uh, low, pack, low impact development improvements. Uh, for these scores, the lower number indicates a higher difficulty. Uh, for example, if it's in a part of Old Town that has no existing facility, uh, the fix or retrofit would be a standalone new facility, which we would need to uh, acquire land where there is little or virtually none to be bought or um, install a facility in the right of way. The scoring would also be based on uh, water quality because of its proximity to Snoqualmie River. Our last characterization category is the outfall location, which I talked about earlier when um, I talked about identifying subbasins at the development or plat level. So for outfall location, considerations of the receiving water body's vulnerabilities are highlighted by changes in surface runoff, water quality, and volume. Uh, we wanted to highlight the facility's proximity to sensitive areas, and to do this by identifying water quality, we would look at small creeks, 
uh, lakes and Snoqualmie River. And then for erosion or detention, mapped, we would look at the mapped erosion hazard areas and steep slopes. In this case, the higher score indicated a greater need for retrofit based on the receiving water body. So this is a visual representation of how we've tried to organize um, our characterization and scoring to produce a ranked list. Also indicated in our performance characterization is a tree reduction factor. This factor is actually more like the inverse of the, percent, the current percent of tree cover. Um, we use this as a weighting factor because although a facility may have been installed in 1988, the canopy cover of the development or neighborhood is now a significant factor in reducing the amount of stormwater that gets to the facility by way of interception and transpiration. We did not include uh, dedicated open areas or NGPAs at the time of development in this percentage. Uh, these percentages were calculated using aerial photos and interpolation through GIS um, that was done by our consultant ESA. Similarly, we used a weighting factor for um, outfall location that was calculated by dividing the current impervious surface by the pre-developed parcel area to get the percentage of impervious surface that's currently there. Once each category have it, has its respective score, we multiply them together, together to get uh, aggregate prioritized rank based on our characterizations. Higher scores or ranks indicate the greater need for retrofit. So using Cameron Park as an example for our evaluation, we can see as shown in that, the colorful picture of impervious surface, the development is split between three sub basins, which you can kind of see with the orange line. Um, this makes it relatively complex evaluation. The design for these facilities was based on the 1990 King County Stormwater Design Manual and include detention pipes within each sub-basin, which, per, and those are red, um, and those provide low detention and even lower water quality. It does have 17% forest cover currently and, 53, and only 53% impervious surface coverage. Uh, for this case, uh, in Cameron Park, these really small diameter detention pipes are all located in the backyards of residents in easements uh, with no formal stormwater tract, and that makes retrofitting projects for these facilities extremely difficult. Um, this is an example output of scores generated for two of the three sub-basins in Cameron Park. Um, you can see that the water quality score is high because it is a detention pipe with no water quality component. Uh, the next step that we would do in the evaluation process would be to apply additional filters. Um, these additional filters will be taken into account and used to review and modify our prioritized list. Um, these filters include ownership, if it's private or if it's public, any known hotspots or system deficiencies, um, potential for incorporating on-site LID, um, while also looking at upstream or downstream mitigation opportunities. Once we have identified our five retrofit projects, um, which we are very close to, we'll get the five conceptual design reports from that. And they'll include things like the basin and site description, any alternatives considered, uh, the design analysis, and preliminary costs. These efforts will continue to support the City of Duval's Capital Improvement Projects list and citywide retrofit opportunities. The image shown here is a project we completed, competed for as a part of the DOE retrofit grant. Um, prior to the retrofit, the pond was, an asphalt was asphalt lined with little detention and no qu water quality. Um, we received a $300,000 grant that will provide a huge increase in storage and flow, flow control where the water quality improvements will be a wet pool and grass lined outfall swale. The steps we are working on currently is our LID toolbox. We have been working on a pilot project for this approach, which is a seven lot development adjacent to Coe Clemens Creek, and it's called Bow Court. This project will help us build our LID toolbox for new development 
and will act as a planning tool tailored to devolve for erosion and water quality based on topography, soil type, and hydrology. It will comply with all MPDES and King County Surface Water Design Manual requirements. And this approach may also include incentives um, dangling a carrot in order for developers to go above and beyond the current adopted requirements. So a little bit more detail, um, the project is called Boat Court. It's a bit different because uh, it had existing legal loss of record. And for those of you that don't know, this meant that we had less potential to enforce stormwater requirements that come with a traditional plat. Um, the project also had a very limited outfall opportunity because of its proximity to that steep slope of the Coquemins Creek. So in order to eliminate any on-site stormwater facility, this project successfully implemented dry wells, pavers, and bioretention to manage its stormwater. And this is a win-win both for the developer and the city. Our expectations in Duval are high, and we are looking to require design and engineering to go above and beyond promoting innovation when managing stormwater. Thank you for listening. Does anybody have any questions? And again, Aaron Bowie from ESA is here to help me. Okay, thanks, uh, Larissa. Um, this is the opportunity to submit questions. Um, I'm not seeing uh, questions here. We can all enjoy the, the photograph that Larissa has provided us with the, uh, the little guys looking out of the catch basin there. Uh, The other, um, the, the, other, um, the other thing we do is it, it turns out that the, um, the poll questions were, um, were, all, were all provided at once. So we're going to uh, go ahead and try that again. Um, and, and people can, um, can basically answer all of the poll questions at once. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, and give people a couple minutes to do that. Um, I think Larissa, Larissa, is there uh, some people talking in the background there? Um, possibly. I will mute myself okay. unless there's any questions. Yeah. So we'll let um, people work on the poll there for a little bit, and I, um, I actually, I actually have a question for you here, um, Larissa. On the um, on the boat court, you mentioned the dry wells, and I was wondering if you could just give a brief description of how those were constructed. As far as as far as I know, they're on individual lots. So they're managing the um, that was it was a little bit before my time being here, but oh. they're on individual lots and they're managing the roof runoff. So they're individual BMPs. Okay. Yeah, this is Michael in the PNCW office. Uh, because we had those questions all structured into one poll, even if you answered them before by relaunching the poll. Uh, we would ask that you answer them again because when we relaunch the poll, your previous answers are no longer there. So help us out, uh, help Stormwater Committee out, and let's get some interesting information here. Everybody would uh, take a, just a moment more to scroll through. There's four questions total. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Manpower funding. Oh. So there's a question, I guess, that I can answer. Yeah, go for it. Okay, so the question is who maintains the LAD? Um, of the very last example, so Bull Court. 
and it will it will be maintained by the HOA or individual lot owners. So, Loris, have you found, um, you know, how, how do you deal with um, the the limited staffing resources you have in a small small town <laughs> like Duval? Yes, that is a fabulous question because um, I'm actually the assistant city engineer and the utility and uh, utility inspector. So we all wear a lot of hats. Um, we all work really closely, and we're all grant motivated. So. We're like a big, small, happy family. <laughs> <laughs> we try to organize our asset management. We're trying to really ramp that up so it takes less of an impact on our maintenance crew um, because we only have, you know, sometimes one person, sometimes we get three people. We have our summer hires um, that do all of our pond maintenance and uh, any deficiencies that were found in the last um, inspection period. So. We are a small town, but we still have big problems. <laughs> yeah. And Scott, I've uh, stopped that poll and uh, we're sharing the results now if you want to run through them very quickly. Okay. Looks like uh, we have um, most people from Puget Sound and the Portland area with um, a few other folks from Western Washington and Western Oregon and, um, and Idaho. So um, that's pretty broad geographic diversity. Um, looks like Eastern, Eastern Washington, Eastern Oregon are the only areas we don't have any uh, participants. Um, let's see, the second question, what tools and techniques are you using in your stormwater retrofit planning and or designs? And it looks like uh, public private partnerships uh, is leading the pack. Retrofit strategy priority plan is second. Riparian enhancement is third, and then um, tied for third is none of the above. And the third question here, what is nudging stormwater retrofits to happen in your jurisdiction? Looks like we have a three-way tie between permit requirements and or lawsuits. A second, the second leader is community demand. Um, such as solving flooding, water quality, or habitat problems. And the third, um, third selection there is aging, failing, and failing infrastructure that needs to be replaced. Um, the other grants are um, a close fourth place, and uh, other community priorities is coming in uh, fifth. Well, it's good to see that there's um, no one selected the uh, node retrofits are happening in my jurisdiction. That's, uh, that's nice to see. And the final question, what do you think the biggest issue with stormwater system maintenance is? Uh, well, funding availability is the winner on that one. Uh, low priority is coming in second. And um, third and fourth is manpower and ownership, public versus private. So thank you everyone for participating in that poll. I'm, uh, I'm now going to um, introduce our third speaker, Jenny Gauss. Jenny, go ahead and, um, and get your presentation going while I'm talking. So okay. Jenny is the um, manager of Kirkland Surface Water Utility since it was founded in 1998, which uh, I'm, I'm pretty impressed that um, She's, um, she's been there for that long, that's, um, that's impressive. Um, she's a licensed civil engineer. She's got 20 years of experience in stormwater management with an emphasis on watershed and stormwater utility planning and NPDES compliance. And uh, she's, uh, she gets motivated to incorporate um, flow control and water quality retrofits into capital projects. And uh, she likes, uh, I think what she's gonna talk about a lot in her presentation is um, addressing other, um, other benefits, community benefits, other than just the stormwater aspects. And with that, Jenny, I'm gonna let you run with it. All right, thank you, good morning. It's really inspiring to see what 
jurisdictions, both small and large, in Duval and in um, the Portland area, are doing. It's, it's really neat to see that. Um, and as I get started, I want to give credit to um, AHBL and also to NHC, uh, who helped with development of many of these slides. I've, I've uh, altered some of them, but uh, they really helped uh, with the groundwork and the framework. And then also want to um, recognize uh, the EPA, especially the National Estuary Program uh, and the Department of Ecology for their continued support of uh, watershed planning. So um, today I'm going to focus, uh, give you a little bit of context about Kirkland, um, talk about some of the stormwater reasons for stormwater retrofits in Kirkland. Uh, also talk about sort of the, the drivers and the ties to other jurisdictions. Um, it's fascinating to hear the answers to that poll question, because uh, here in Kirkland, I think they're pretty different than the answers to those, the poll question. Uh, and then talk through the six steps that we use to retrofit planning at the sub-basin level. So Kirkland is a city of about 85,000 people. It's on the eastern shore of Lake Washington, over here. Uh, it is a highly urbanized area. Uh, most of our watersheds have at least 50% impervious surface. It is largely already built out according to current zoning. Uh, we have a lot of redevelopment going on, either through single family infill, uh, subdivisions of two to four lots are actually our largest uh, residential category at the moment. And then uh, we have significant redevelopment of some of our retail and business centers. Um, there's a lot of area that at the same time that is zoned single family and was developed in the 1970s and 80s and that's unlikely to redevelop in any large way. Um, the city has a large coastline on Lake Washington. Uh, most of the city slopes toward the lake uh, and the city does pride itself on being green. Um, as Scott mentioned, the city council has been very supportive of surface water needs and projects. Uh, they formed a utility in 1998, and since that time, progress has been made on flood reduction, water quality improvement, and habitat res uh, restoration. Uh, the city is subject to the Phase 2 NPDES Municipal Stormwater Permit. And the two largest watersheds are Forbes Creek and Juanita Creek, and these make up uh, over half of the city. Let's use the button. And again, uh, most of Kirkland was developed uh, before current stormwater standards were in place. The uh, dark brown areas are areas developed since 1992, meaning that they have at least somewhat modern stormwater controls. But you can see that the majority of the city was developed um, in the 60s through the 80s uh, with few or no stormwater controls. The other thing I'll throw in here is that we have uh, a lot of areas in the city where development is extremely close to our stream. Uh, stream buffers were not put in place until the late 1980s and so we have a lot of situations where um, people may want to take care of a stream but their house is also uh, 10 feet from that stream so there's just not a lot of space. Uh, and most stormwater facilities in the city are underground. Um, they're vaults and tanks, and that's because land prices are very high. Um, also, it was actually against city code to build above ground ponds until about 1998. So in the um, sort of historic area of the city, uh, everything is underground. So why was Kirkland considering uh, doing stormwater retrofits? As you'll see in a minute, um, uh, there's some drivers, but from a stormwater perspective, we have streams that are down cutting. We have no major rivers, but we do have many small streams that have down cutting problems, as you see on the right side. Um, fish habitat, salmon habitat has been declining, and that's a concern that the lifting of Chinook salmon is a threatened species uh, that puts a potential cloud over economic development and all development in the city if we do not make progress on removing that listing. Um, so we have uh, flow control problems uh, that have caused habitat degradation. We have water quality problems. Many of our streams have uh, 303 delistings for bacteria, temperature, and soft oxygen. Um, 
and we have a few scattered flooding problems that um, people care about quite a bit. So those are sort of the stormwater reasons uh, for retrofits, and we want to um, try to plan at the uh, sub-basin scale um, because it gives you a lot more opportunities than planning at just the site level. You can start to see um, tie-ins to other city priorities, which I'll talk about more in a minute. Um, and as Arlo Guthrie famously said, one big pile is smaller than, or one big pile is better than two small piles. And so there are in some cases a lot more opportunities to do one large facility that might be more efficient and operate better than lots of small facilities. So our city has really been focusing on doing that planning at sort of the, the sub-basin scale. So what are some of the drivers? And, and this is, you know, if you're starting from scratch in your uh, city, what are some of the drivers that cause retrofits to happen? Um, maybe your jurisdiction was sued either over wastewater or stormwater issues. Uh, maybe the community demands it. And I was fascinated to see that um, some of you listening that your communities demanded it. Um, I would say that Kirkland has a high interest in the environment, but when it comes to the specifics, saying, you know, we want better water quality or we want this or that, we have not heard that so much, with the exception being maybe some flooding problems that, of course, people are very visible and people care about a lot. Um, maybe you have an NPDES permit or a TMDL that could require it. Um, that's not the case in Kirkland because we have a phase two permit that doesn't currently include retrofit planning. So we expect that that will change with the next permit. Uh, perhaps you have uh, existing facilities that are aging or failing. It sounds like that was maybe partially the case in Duval. Uh, we have that situation in Kirkland with a lot of underground, again, tanks and vaults that are um, corrugated metal that are starting to fail. Um, so that approach sort of will become more important in Kirkland, though it's not currently. Um, there are a lot of opportunities to partner as redevelopment is happening, uh, either on the pub, private or the public. Um, Kirkland has had a lot of success with uh, asking questions with every, uh, for example, every public transportation project. We now go through a process where we say, could we add water quality treatment to that project, even if it's not required? What would it cost? Because you're ripping up the street anyway, so it's a really good time to do it. So those opportunities to partner are one of the big drivers for us. And then another big one is just having funding available from other agencies and organizations. As I mentioned, uh, Ecology and the National Estuary Program have been a, a really big spur for us to um, launch into retrofit planning. And then the absolutely biggest one for Kirkland is connecting stormwater issues to other stuff that people care about in their communities. Uh, as you'll see with the Totem Lake area, um, we have a whole business district that's redeveloping. Um, we see that there may be opportunities to um, uh, provide stormwater mitigation for our capital projects at the same time that we're doing retrofits, and that would be more efficient and possibly cheaper. Uh, and then looking for opportunities for things like community open space, wildlife habitat, or perhaps there's a park that the city's interested in redeveloping and you can connect to that. So I think tying to those goals, especially in a highly urbanized area, where stormwater is competing with a lot of other needs. Um, people don't necessarily see that there's sort of large stream corridors to save. So connecting stormwater to those other drivers, I think is really key. And uh, before launching into the steps of sub-basin playing, there's a lot of sort of background work that has or, or could happen um, in order to make retrofits sort of actually come to fruition in your utility. Um, with Kirkland, uh, it was planning at the watershed scale. Uh, we were very fortunate that King County came in and did a study of the Juanita Creek Basin. Uh, half of that basin actually used to be King, unincorporated. King County is now part of the city of Kirkland. And uh, King County came in and actually looked at um, a set of retrofit scenarios, and they tested each one based on whether it would meet uh, goals for biological integrity, for some flow metrics, and for some habitat metrics. And, and their aim was to look at which scenario came out the best, 
and also to look at the cost of retrofitting an entire watershed. And out of that study came this, um, I think it was $4 billion to retrofit the Juanita watershed, um, which is a really staggering number. But the point was to take that to the state level and to city folks and start to say, you know, here's the big picture of what it costs, here's what's involved, and sort of let's get started. Um, there's also the state watershed characterization information really helped give us a leg up because the Juanita watershed came up as a high priority. Uh, and that work helped um, cities, but also at the state level to figure out sort of where to start. Uh, and then the other thing is, uh, I don't see it on this slide, but is um, the city has done quite a bit of work on surface water master plans for the utility that lay out priorities. And um, our master plan included retrofitting as a priority, even though it is not required, we feel that it's sort of a way of staying one step ahead of, of regulations and our city council has been very, um, very uh, supportive of that. So then we get to the, which subbasin do we start at once we know sort of the big issue. Um, we look for a subbasin, maybe where we have a flooding or a water quality problem, again, because that's very visible. Um, some other uh, things that you can look at to try to prioritize, looking at the flow relative to the size of the basin. Uh, over in the Forbes Creek watershed, we started looking at this and we found that we had one very small watershed that contributed a very outsized amount of flow because it was highly impervious. And so we're actually uh, working on a separate NEP grant um, to do some planning in that basin. Um, do you have land available is another, you know, are there places where you could put retrofit opportunities uh, is another possible way to prioritize. And then again, looking at those other jurisdiction goals, what else is going on that you can uh, sort of tie into? And so again, with Kirkland, it was really all about Totem Lake. Um, you can see Totem Lake is kind of in the bottom of this subbasin right here. And for years, the city has been trying to get Totem Lake to pop. Uh, it's an area that had a mall that was sort of falling into disrepair. Um, there was a fair amount of business activity, but none of it was really sort of popping for the city. And so there was just a huge amount of effort um, around making economic development happen in Kirkland. It is the engine of the city. Most of the tax revenue for the city does come from that area. There's a major regional hospital, uh, but there was an interest in just making more happen, making the mall redevelop. And a lot of that is starting to happen now. And so uh, Totem Lake was just very important on the city level. And so I felt that trying to come in and deal with some of the stormwater issues in that basin would be of the greatest benefit to the city and we get the most support from the city council. So again, Totem Lake, it's about 665 acres, this subbasin, it's highly urbanized. Uh, the impervious surface is a whopping 68%. Um, it's part of the overall Wadita Creek system, as I mentioned, that King County studied. Um, and now I'm going to go through some of the specific steps involved in planning at that subbasin level. And this is an overview of the steps. And the first is to set the restoration goals. For Totem Lake, uh, this was, some of the work was done for us by King County. Uh, one of the scenarios that they tested in the retrofit study I just mentioned was to look at the new uh, uh, 2012 ecology uh, stormwater management manual for Western Washington was coming out with a LID performance standard, which is controlling flows from 8% of the two year to the two year, as well as the previous standard, which is controlling the duration of flows from the two year to the 50 year. And that scenario was tested through the Juanita Creek work and found to be the most effective at improving BIBI scores, water quality, and flow metrics. And so um, it was pretty easy to come in and say uh, the goal for Totem Lake is to meet the requirements of the new 2012 manual. Um, so that's uh, flow control, water quality. Um, we have flooding problems that uh, directly surrounding the lake that were not included in the NEP grants because NEP grants focus mostly on water quality, but we did sort of study flooding off to the side of that grant to see what impact our retrofits would have on the flooding. And we also wanted to use infiltration and LID where possible 
uh, again, with the idea of using um, soil and using infiltration to um, control stormwater to the degree that we could. So the next step is to conduct GIS analysis. This meant uh, gathering up a lot of data um, about different properties, including ownership, uh, is it vacant, is it a parking lot, um, information about the stormwater system, uh, where does this property fit in relation to the stormwater system, is it a pollutant hotspot, um, maybe it's an industrial site that has a high potential to pollute, uh, is it near critical areas, what are the soils like, um, does it have treatment already, so gathering up all that data was, was really key and then starting to do screening at a couple of different le levels. Um, there's screening at sort of a course level, mostly looking at sort of where, um, where is that property within the watershed. And uh, this course screen had been identified about 230 sites that could potentially be used for retrofits. And then from there proceeded to a fine screening, which is looking a little bit more closely at what could you drain to that parcel? Who owns it? Uh, what are the sensitive areas? Um, just really honing in. And that um, was used to go from 230 sites all the way down to 29 sites that were retrofit candidates. And then from there, you start going out in the field and actually looking at these properties. Um, some of them you find that uh, it looked really good on a map, but like this one on the upper right here, it looked really good on a map, but then you get out there and you find, oops, it's um, highway right-of-way, it's the right-of-way of Interstate 405, uh, and it's got quite a bit of a slope, and so maybe it's not such a good site. Maybe there's some utility conflicts or other things going on. So um, that field screening was all documented on different forms. And that was used to narrow it further from 29 sites down to 22 sites. Uh, another portion of feasibility is figuring out uh, public interests and concerns. In the case of Totem Lake, there, um, there's some residential area sort of up on the perch above the business district, but there's not like a citizen group in the traditional sense that is like save Totem Lake kind of thing. Um, so we turned more to the business and real estate community to find out what their interests and concerns were with stormwater and with potential um, partnerships. We convened what's called a technical assistance panel through the Urban Land Institute. And that is brings together a group of um, folks that volunteer their time. They are experts. In, in this case, uh, real estate development, um, uh, finance, and other aspects of sort of land development. And we ask them questions about, you know, things like, should we look for public-private partnerships or should we just build things on public property? Um, what are your thoughts about facilities providing uh, multiple benefits? And so they met over the course of two days and then provided a presentation to the city. And so that went into our feasibility analysis. Uh, then we start looking at some of the location specific concepts. Uh, we chose, uh, you know, what, what type of facility could you put there? What size does it need to be? Um, sort of what are the um, sensitive areas and permitting issues and start to looking at, you know, site-specific stuff. And then again, this is just a summary of looking at the performance as well as the feasibility from all these different aspects. Um, what would the impact be on flows? What would the impact be on flooding, uh, and water quality? And then um, do you have space? Who owns the property? And what's it going to cost? Uh, we tried to make each site-specific project meet the 2012 um, ecology manual. In some cases, there wasn't quite enough space. And so you have, with retrofits, often you just have to kind of get what you can get. Um, but we did try to um, choose uh, sites where we could get enough to, um, to do a reasonable job of meeting those requirements. And again, just looking at the performance, the impacts on flooding, um, particularly in sort of the area of the uh, Totem Lake Boulevard over here where the lake has 
historically overflowed onto the road and caused some problems. And so we wanted to say, what will these facilities do for the Juanita Creek watershed as a whole? And also what will they do for the flooding? And then we ranked and prioritized all of those different sites. There was a big meeting with uh, city staff uh, and we chose our top three sites. Um, the Totem Lake Mall was not chosen because by the time that we uh, were meeting, the mall redevelopment was already in progress and already had its own stormwater path sort of set out for it. Um, and we chose two out of the three of our top sites were um, publicly owned properties. And this is based on information from the technical assistance panel. They sort of looked at our situation and they said, you know what, um, projects on public land, um, maybe in some cases more expensive because if they're in a street, there's a lot of utility conflicts, but you have a lot more certainty that they'll get built because you already control the property and you don't control the sort of pace of redevelopment. Uh, so they really sort of directed us to focus on, on public properties. Um, the third site that we looked at, we did include uh, private property because we felt like it was one with a very high potential for redevelopment. And so wanted to have not so much a specific design, but more sizing available so that we'd be in a good position to negotiate uh, if and when that project um, starts, to, uh, starts to redevelop. So then uh, with our top three, uh, we developed a conceptual design. This is an example of starting to lay out, you know, what areas are you going to treat? Uh, what type of facility are you going to treat with? And what might that cost? And then we wrapped everything up into an implementation plan, um, looking at which projects we'd want to fund first, uh, looking at financing. Uh, Kirkland has typically only used surface water fees and grants, but uh, there was some thought that we might also look at things like bonding or um, other pub public-private partnerships, other types of things, and so you want to have that in your plan. Um, you want to look at whether you're going to depend on uh, on-site LAD for a portion of your treatment versus off-site. Uh, in Totem Lake, it turned out that the um, valley floor where most of the businesses that are likely to redevelop sit. Uh, there's not a lot of potential for LID because the groundwater is very high. And so that wasn't as much of an issue for us, but something that definitely we would want to consider in other areas. Um, and then if there are programmatic actions that are not already captured in say a surface water master plan, you'd want them to include them here. Uh, for Kirkland, because we are a phase two NPDES city and we have a fairly robust surface water master plan, uh, things like say source control for pollutants, education and outreach, were largely covered in those other plans. Um, but again, it's something that's important to consider if you don't have those other types of plans in your city. And then finally, just you want to document your goals um, so that you can measure your performance uh, after the fact and as you go for funding. So the implementation plan really helps you get from idea to reality. And Kirkland is now at the point where we have applied for design and construction funding for a project uh, that would go under a city park at 132nd Avenue and it's called 132nd Square Park because it's where two 132nd Avenue and 132nd Street intersect. Uh, we want to put a deep infiltration facility under that park. Turns out that the park was planning to redevelop and was short of funding. And so this is a great partnership opportunity um, to be able to uh, sort of give park department a leg up and also get our stormwater goals met. And the soils are pretty good there. So there's a great opportunity. It can serve about 50 acres of upstream residential area, that's area that was not likely to redevelop, so it's a really good candidate for a retrofit, and it will help protect Totem Lake, which is downstream of this project, um, help with the flooding and whatnot um, with the lake, which will help the business community to feel more comfortable that um, stormwater issues are being, are being taken care of. Um, sort of a side note that was of interest um, with this was that we did look at whether it would make sense to use the lake 
as a detention facility. Essentially, that is what the lake is doing now. Um, the businesses around the lake have no detention. All the water is just going into the lake. And so we actually went to Ecology and we said, would it make sense not to require detention, but to put a weir in the lake and then to do wetland improvements and hydrologic improvements with the lake? Uh, Ecology said, no, that's, that's not an option because you need to meet your NPDES permit requirements before your discharges hit waters of the state. So that was not an option. So that's part of why we backed up and looked at some of these other facilities. Um, so we applied for an Ecology Stormwater Financial Assistance Grant uh, in 2016 uh, for four and a half million and were awarded a draft offer of funding, but then the state budget was hit by the uh, problems with the Model Toxics Control Act Fund, which was the source of money for the FSAP project. Uh, so we applied again this year and have a draft offer of funding um, and are sort of anxiously awaiting the capital budget from the legislature to see uh, if we can move forward with the project in 2018. Uh, in the meantime, we're conducting some geotechnical feasibility, uh, groundwater monitoring, and flow monitoring to make sure that we have all of the good uh, information to feed in the, to the design once it does happen. So. Um, it's really nice to see this have come all the way from sort of glimmer in the eye of wouldn't it be nice to do something to um, just about at the point of starting design and construction. So I would say in terms of lessons learned, uh, the big ones are tie stormwater into other things happening in your jurisdiction. Um, conduct your Utility and watershed scale planning so that you're ready to jump on any opportunities to plan at the sub-basin level. And finally, um, uh, again, just tie your stormwater retrofit needs to other priorities in your community because you're likely to be a lot more successful. So um, with that, I will close. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Oh, OK. So. Um Everyone feel free to submit questions. Not seeing any up right now, but um, we'll... Um, and at this stage of the game, I would say, let's uh, feel free to submit questions for, for Jenny, and uh, or if you have questions you'd like to submit to the other the other presenters or to all the, all the, all the presenters, um, feel free to do that. So I have um, so I have a question. Uh, this kind of relates to uh, probably to Jenny's um, presentation, but the um, the other other presenters feel free to jump in. Um, so what uh, what is the hook that you're using to get retrofits to happen in your in your community? So again, in Kirkland, it's tying them to other stuff that the city is interested in or cares about. It's looking at redevelopment of uh, this business district and saying, how can we work with that to, um, to help it happen? Um, and I would also say other people's money, as our city manager likes to say. <laughs> I don't think this would be happening without grants. Yeah. So, I mean, we have baked into our utility rates uh, retrofit projects and retrofit planning, but uh, it tends to get, because it's not required by some of the other drivers, it tends to get pushed out of the way, um, and the grants really help bring it back front and center. Right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna raise this question for all of the panelists. Um, do you feel that retrofits should be included in the um, NPDES um, municipal stormwater permits um, to a greater degree than they are already? I guess right now they're it's required in phase one permits, but not for phase two at this stage of the game. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't ha- I don't know anything about that. That this is Larissa. Hi, this is Jadine, and we're a Phase One um, community. Um, we currently have um, a requirement of one per year. However, um, the the district is only treating probably thirty percent of the treated or the developed area. So, I think you know being able to encourage or incentivize to get retrofits in, I think it's going to be important so that we can get more area treated. I mean, it really comes down to funding, though, trying to figure out how how to get that. Um, for us, we're a separate stormwater s- system, so we don't have the SANI funds necessary that some other places can use um, to incorporate different kinds of stormwater management. Um, so I uh, kind of following up on the question from before is really that public private partnership has been key to our success of being able to get these retrofits in by oversizing facilities and providing additional funds to um, to do that with property owners um, and agencies that are willing to uh, partner with us and know that we're here for the long haul and that we're you know going to take care of these facilities um, for the long term. So a lot of public agencies and private businesses kind of like that. Um, Although there is fees and, or I'm sorry, there are costs associated with maintenance. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Right. So your jurisdiction maintains, J.D.? If you build a joint facility, then the uh, Clean Water Services does the maintenance? Yeah. In all the ones that I've worked on, it's, um, they are regional facilities, and so the district is taking on the the maintenance. We do have um, we do have privately um, developed and maintained lots of private water quality facilities, but not usually um, requiring to treat public runoff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In Duval, we. Um, when we started this, the project and updating our plan, we wanted to look more at regional facilities, but unfortunately, because of our size, um, we just don't have the opportunity. So as much as we would love to go in that direction and even take over ownership of them, it's just, it's not feasible for us, unfortunately. So it's unfortunate. So is, Larissa, is the limitation um, Funding or is it just staff or I guess both? Oh, yeah, it's funding for us because we do have a, a stormwater fee, um, but that that goes to main, directly to maintenance. Um, so we have no funding for retrofits or anything like that. So we're 100% grant um, run for any projects that we do. Right. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Well, I think at this stage of the game, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up. Um, we're a little bit early, which um, which is good. And um, I really appreciate everyone uh, participating. Um, let's give a, a silent round of applause for our panelists. At least I'll, I'll clap. <laughs> And, uh, and thanks to all the attendees for, um, for signing in. And please, uh, please provide us with feedback so we can uh, continue, these, continue to improve these webinars um, moving forward. And um, thank you very much. Uh, Michael, anything to add? Uh, <clears throat> no, this is Mike in the PNCWA office. Once again, you'll get uh, PDFs of the presentations and a recording will be available uh, again, yes, hopefully uh, very shortly, recording uh, within a day, I hope, but we will, we'll let you know when that's up there. Uh, you will receive one email and the system doesn't send it until tomorrow, it doesn't send it until 24 hours afterwards, uh, asking you for uh, some uh, feedback and uh, about if you want PDHs or CEUs, et cetera. Other than that, I'd like to thank all our panelists and Scott. Thank you all our attendees. I think that's it. Scott, whatever you, whenever you're ready, we'll shut it down.
Okay, sounds good. Jadine asked me to plug the awards once once more. Um, uh, please uh, please feel free to submit applications for those two stormwater awards uh, sometime in the next ten days. And that's everything. Uh, thank you very much.